Well, it's June, which means I have to be contemplative again. <laughs> the reason that's the case is it's Father's Day. And um, to be honest and frank, I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out why. Not why in a sense, like why is it Father's Day, but if Father's Day has this thing, it makes me think of my dad and my granddad's and all the, the strong men that I've ever known in my life, um, but particularly my dad. And I don't get it. You see, my dad worked at a coal fire power plant my whole life. The only reason he stopped working at the plant was because his back went out and he had to have back surgery. And so that kind of forced him to retire, thank God. But it wasn't fun. It was hard. Ladders, steps, having to work over, shift work. It was not fun. I can remember him sleeping during the day sometimes and getting up and going to work in the middle of the night or coming home just as I was getting up from uh, sleeping all night. And he didn't have to. And the reason I mean he didn't have to was because he never chose to advance in the company. And the reason that he gave was, I'd lose my seniority. See, if he would have advanced or went to another department or whatever, what that means is that he'd go back to being the low man on the totem pole. And to him, being able to take the vacation time that he wanted off to spend with us was more important than any of that. And I have to think, why? Why would he do that? Why would he do something hard on his body that wore him down and things like that? And it was, the answer that I got was not one that I liked. Because it's the same one that I do. And the same one I think a lot of us do. And he did it because he could. Because he was strong enough to do it. Oftentimes in our lives, what happens is we're called to do things that are difficult that are hard and, and we think why why do we have to be the ones to do that and the answer is because you can my dad gave of himself physically not just financially and things like that but physically because he wanted to teach his kids a lesson and part of that lesson was if you have something if you can do something if you can help people and to him being with us on vacations and things was much more important than anything else. If you have and you can share, then you should. Sharing means care. It's typically what we call it, right? Hospitality, the root cause of hospitality. And it's something that's important in the Bible. Hospitality is a theme that comes up over and over again, especially in the Old Testament. It's something more than just being nice. It's, it's not just this social obligation or this contract that you have. In our story from Genesis this morning, there's a lot going on. It's almost like there are two different stories going on at once here. And the way it starts is that Abraham's just kind of sitting, chilling by the tent, minding his own business, and then these people show up. And he doesn't know them from Adam, right? They could be necessarily anybody. We don't know for sure if he knows that it's God or what, but whatever, it doesn't matter because what does matter is because he sees people and he thinks to himself, I have work to do. And so immediately he gets up, he prostrates himself before them and he says, let me serve you. And he runs around mad. He does like this mad dash throughout the tent, getting things ready. He runs to Sarah and says, you need to bake now get to work. And so she starts making bread furiously, getting flour and all of these ingredients. He runs to the pen, gets like the nicest calf, the juiciest veal that he can find. He takes it and says, prepare this now. I don't even know how they did it. He said, take it, prepare it now. That would have been a lot of work, especially if you're trying to do things quickly. Also the baking. Baking does not take uh, a short amount of time. And so he's showing this like investment that he has. Like, and he begs the people, he's like, stay, have a drink, take a load off, rest for a little while. And he gets curds and whey, and it's like a full spread, a full spread in front of these people, made at the drop of a hat. Nobody was prepared, nobody was ready. 
And you have to kind of stop and think, why? Well, maybe he did it because he knew that it was God, right? Maybe he was just doing it because he wanted to be blessed, except that doesn't make sense because if we think narratively in terms of the story, this happens after the Abrahamic covenant has already been established. And what is it we read in that? You will be blessed to be a blessing to the nations. The fact of the matter is Abraham was not given righteousness, as Paul says, because of following God or doing the things that he did. He just was chosen by God to do something. And God comes to Abraham and says, blessed to be a blessing. You have, so now you have this obligation, this job to do, that you can bless others because you have and you can. And it would seem like very much he takes this job seriously. I've only seen people run around like this when family members come over. I can remember vividly um, preparing for the Thanksgiving and Christmases at my mom and dad's house. And it was always the same. You got to clean the house. Why? Grandma's coming over. She's going to say something about it not being clean. Furious, mad dash cleaning, running around, scrubbing infinitesimal little things for fear that my grandmother would walk around inspecting things and getting dust. Real When, you know, if I have friends over, yeah, nobody cares. Nobody cared that if the house was a mess or there was necessarily things left out. And that's how it was. This mad dash going around to getting these things done. But Abraham knows and remembers the simple fact that he has. He has been blessed so that he might be a blessing. Abraham and Sarah in general, they're very complicated characters because, again, they were chosen by God to do things. And I'm just, I'll be blunt here. They're people. They screw up. In our reading last week, we talked about Hagar and Ishmael, and, and I, I believe we did. If not, we're going to do that. But God had this plan. You're going to have a, a child, Sarah. And she does. This is part of the passage we read. We get down on Sarah because of this passage. We think that she somehow has less faith because of it. But what happens is later she gets a little bit jealous and she wants Ishmael and Hagar sent away, even though that was her scheme because God said this was going to happen and she tried to take matters into her own hands. And this happens a few other times. There's this whole stuff in Egypt about pretending to be just brother and sister and things like that. There's these stories where they hear God's word, they know God's word, but they want to use their plan instead because they're afraid. And maybe that's why Sarah laughed. There's a little bit of fear. I would suggest that we don't have to be hard on Sarah because of this. It makes sense. It's logical. She's old. Abraham's old. How many of you here in your ages would like to have a baby right now? Yeah, I know. They're hard. Babies are really hard. They require constant care, constant vigilance. And I'm going, to be, I'm going to be honest. They're cute. Yeah, they also smell. And like you have to like lotion them if you want that cute baby smell that everyone has. Everyone loves the you know, chubby cheeks of a baby. Nobody wants to see the baby uh, crying in the middle of the night because they're hungry or, or doing what babies do. And this is what Sarah thinks she's... This is what, this is what these people are saying. This is what Sarah's going to get. And she's like, huh, okay. It's not impossible, though. And the reason it's not impossible is, again, because we have to tie everything back to that covenant that God made with Abraham, which was what? Blessed to be a blessing. This is the land of your descendants, he tells Abraham. They're going to have this land. And he has no descendants at that point. There was no Isaac. There was no Ishmael. There was no nothing. Like It would have to go to someone. Uh, Eliezer was someone that they uh, chose. But God said, no, it's going to come from your son, your biological son. Why? Well, to be a blessing to all nations, to all peoples. Because God in and of God's self 
is a God of hospitality, a God of love, a God of reaching out to people in need. Even if they don't understand, even if people don't understand that need. And that's a lesson that Abraham takes and puts in himself. And that's a lesson I think Sarah takes and puts in herself as well. Because again, she wants the same thing. She's on the same page as Abraham. Yeah, wires get crossed, things get confused, and, and they mess up. They're people. It's, it's going to happen. The end result is still the same. They have been blessed, and so they know that they want to be a blessing to others. It's this beautiful moment where people that don't even necessarily appear as angels are given this hospitality. And, and what is that old song? I think it's by Alabama, maybe? Angels Among Us? Oh, yeah, you know that song. I've heard that song way too many times. It's one of my mom's favorite songs. We sang it all the time uh, in church uh, for special occasions. We, we sang it in choir at school uh, on Christmas. Because, of course, it's a Christmas song, apparently. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, it's a song about giving. Now, who gives first? It's God. God is the one who gives. God is the one who blesses. And the question is, why? Why would God bless? And again, we have the answer. It's the same thing I've been harping on for a while here. Blessed to be a blessing. And I feel like we see that in what happens in the gospel text. When we get to the gospel of Matthew, Jesus is going about doing what? healing, raising the dead, all of the things that Jesus canonically is known for. He's proclaiming the good news, curing every disease, every sickness, and he sees the crowds, and he feels mercy and compassion for these crowds because they are hurting people. You notice how he never yells at somebody who asks of him. He never says, I'm too tired. Come back tomorrow. Business hours are from 8.30 to 4.30 always on the clock as it were and he sees these people in need of a savior and he's moved to compassion and he says the harvest is plentiful but the laborers are few therefore ask the lord of the harvest to send laborers out into the field and so he takes the 12 12 people now we don't know how many crowds were following around jesus but a crowd is probably i would safely say more than 10 He takes the disciples and gives them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out, cure every disease, every sickness. And it's the 12. And <laughs> who does he pick? Well, there's a zealot, there's a couple zealots. You know, they're fiery, uh, hard to control. If you were a little loud, sons of thunder we hear, right? And then there's Peter, and Peter's the guy who, God bless him, really good intentions, winds up denying Jesus. There's Matthew, the tax collector. I love how they point out that Matthew's a tax collector just to say, look at this horrible person that Jesus just chose. Not to mention Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. This is the dream team. This is who Jesus is sending out. These guys. The unqualified, the ones who can and will mess up. And how he sends them out is troubling. It's problematic because what does he say to them? Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And you stop and think, whoa, it's a little, uh, a little xenophobic there. This doesn't seem right to us. I thought, you know, God loved everyone. What happened to love God, love people? Like, where's the love there? Like, why are we picking and choosing here? And then you think back, you think back to Abraham, you think back to that covenant, and you realize the continuation that's happening here. Blessed to be a blessing. Because it's from Abraham that the world will be blessed. Everything that happens to Abraham, the good stuff, even the bad stuff, really, especially the good stuff, the stuff that blesses him, gives him power and authority and all of these things, all of that happens to bless the world. 
He's reminding the people of the job, the promise that was made to Abraham, and the fact that if they're descendants of Abraham, spoiler alert, they are, they then need to pick up the pace and act like Abraham a little bit. The message isn't just for the disciples. Jesus came for all. We know that. We understand that. We accept that. But it has to start somewhere. And that's where it goes. And even that, though, it's problematic. The reason it's a problem for us is because on the one hand, we think, why? Like, why? If I have stuff, like I earned it, right? Like even if I was blessed, I earned it, right? Like this is mine. God blessed me. God gave me all of this stuff. It's mine. It's not. And part of the problem is we tend to have individualistic theology. The theology of one's own self. Ignoring everyone else. I love the fact that Jesus Christ is my own personal savior. But he's not just for me. He's for all people. And if I have something that I feel is really great, why wouldn't I want to share it? This past fall, something amazing happened. Little Debbie did the thing that they always do and they put out their uh, seasonal treats. And I'm talking, of course, of pumpkin delights, one of the greatest things that God has ever made in the world. I absolutely adore the pumpkin delights. And this year I found that they made it into ice cream. Pumpkin flavored ice cream with chunks of pumpkin delight in it. And I thought to myself, Sam can have that just as a little treat. And so I bought a little cup of it. And I'm trying it. Oh, it's so good. Pumpkin flavors melting over my tongue, and I love it so much. And then my youngest comes. Dad, what's that? Crud. Because I know he likes pumpkin delights, too. This is pumpkin delight ice cream, buddy. Oh, that sounds really good. Yeah, it is. And it's like the longest amount of silence that has ever stretched between a father and son before. And I say words that I regretted almost. Do you want to have some? Of course he did. He loves pumpkin ice cream. He takes after me. Except here's the problem with that. There's five other little people in the house. And as soon as they catch wind of something, this day the machine's paying out. Get it while you can, right? So this little cup of ice cream that I had gets divided up seven different ways. And I was like, but I wanted it all to myself. And then I realized that to me it was more important to share something great that I had because of how great it was. And that's just a silly example with ice cream. And yet we live in a world, we live in a society where people just don't have anything. And we wonder and say, what can we do? How can we help people? And we think that there's not enough stuff to help people. And there is. We just don't use it right. And I don't mean just we in general. I mean, society in general doesn't use stuff right. Like, hey, you know, let's have these billionaires make spaceships to go play space cowboy for five minutes. The amount of money that that would have taken to do would have helped so many more people. Like a full third of the beds in hospitals across the world are filled at any given time because people don't have access to clean drinking water. How is that right? There are enough resources to share. The problem is we just, we don't. And the problem is because we think individually. A theology of the self harms the greater community. And we forget the fact that God tells Abraham, you are blessed to be a blessing. We forget the lessons that our fathers have taught us about sharing and loving people. We can solve issues in the world. 
but we have to stop making things about the individual. We take what we have and we actually be about the ministries of hospitality. We share not because we think we're going to get anything out of it, not because we're going to earn our wings in heaven, so to speak, but because it's decent and because it's kind, because we remember that we have been blessed to be a blessing. We need to double down. We need to recommit ourselves to sharing the gospel, not just in word, but in deed. We can solve the issues of the needs of the world if everybody worked together. We just have to remember why it is we have what we have. Amen.